All right, welcome to one of the final panels of Dragon Con 2018. Um, every year I have a panel around this time, and I'm always impressed by the people that are here. So I just want to say thank you very much, because I feel like this is a very important topic. And uh, even if you're recovering from a hangover, that's fine. <laughs> I appreciate everyone being here, and uh, it's really heartening to see people here on a Monday and spending their time this way. Um, so we're here basically to discuss you know, propaganda and artificial intelligence as it relates to propaganda. Um, so I figure a good way to start would be to give a quick primer of kind of what propaganda is. Um, does anyone have any idea of, or how would they would define propaganda? No one. <laughs> I take back the heartening comment. It no, is, it is <laughs> Monday, it is Monday. Anyone, go ahead, sir. Uh, Okay, does everybody kind of hear that? Basically, he's, he's saying that when you're communicating a message to someone, you're insinuating uh, certain messages into that message in order to essentially, you know, change someone else's thoughts surreptitiously without them realizing it or having the ability to critically think about it. That's one, I would argue, method of propaganda. Um, I, I might say that that could be uh, good propaganda. Bad propaganda could just be stating the message over and over again. Right. Yeah. So as to um, encourage either some kind of action or some kind of inaction. Great. And those, those are all excellent answers. And, and, and my research leads to that those definitions, there's psychological, there's sociological, now there's technological. Um, there's multiple avenues, and so, sort of, you know, thinking about the last couple days, um, to me, it's sort of the antithesis of free will. And to put it in the most general sense of the, of the way I understand it, is that you're no longer really concerned, the person sending the message is no longer concerned with allowing the recipients to make their own decisions. And whether they use psychological trickery, uh, inherent biases, uh, repetition or other sort of psychological or sociological or technological tricks to take away that freedom of thought, then I think that would kind of, that's the way I would understand propaganda in a general sense. Um, go ahead, sir. Well, I, by that definition, the universe, every commercial on TV or on the internet is propaganda. Thank you for you, mentioning that. Yes. <laughs> well, to, to me, propaganda isn't necessarily nefarious or in the trying to trick anyone. It's just, it's advertising for a political purpose. You're trying to Convince someone of a political position. Obviously, you're not going to get both sides because that's you're not trying to be news. Propaganda is by, by definition one-sided, but uh, not necessarily disreputable or uh, anything like that. I mean, propaganda should be properly understood distinctly from news reporting, for instance. But it's not inherently any worse than advertising in general. Correct. And one man's propaganda could be another person's marketing. And are you familiar with a guy named Edward Bernays? Um, he's essentially the father of propaganda, or he's commonly referred to as the father, but here I have a book for you. And also the, the, the father of public relations. Father of public relations or propaganda, and his book, obviously titled Propaganda, um, has been around for decades and decades, but he was well known. He did a lot of work with you know, Dodge, Dow Chemical, other companies. Uh, I guess his most famous example would be to convince females to smoke cigarettes by calling them like freedom sticks. Really? Yes. And so a lot of like modern marketing and propaganda or however you want to call it kind of stemmed from him and has been refined over time. I'll let the other panels speak more. I, oh, I, I just <laughs> wanted to say he got into the private sector after working on the Committee on Public Information, which was the U.S.'s domestic propaganda uh, organization during World War I uh, targeted at, you know, 
building um, support for the war effort. And so left, you know, had that military experience um, disseminating information and then sort of brought that to the private sector. Yeah. Oh, I'm Blair Chantella. I'm an attorney uh, here in Georgia based in Kennesaw in a uh, uh, Cartersville area. I've been speaking on these issues for this is my seventh year now. So, uh, I'm Jairus Khan. I work f with uh, with the Mozilla Foundation on issues of internet health, um, and I'm a general malcontent. <laughs> <laughs> um, my name is Carl Grindle. I'm a graduate student at the Georgia Institute of Technology, right down the street, and I've been studying um, uh, Russian propaganda mostly through RT. Uh, with a professor named Dr. Klein in the public policy um, department. How many of the things you guys just said are true? Uh, That's three out the, of four. Th there'll be a test at the end of this. Passing around are examples, and uh, who actually who here knows that or knows of you know the Facebook and Twitter and Russia being involved in those? Okay, so what I'm handing around now are examples that Facebook disclosed to Congress and that Congress released to the public. My understanding is that not all of the examples were released, but a lot of them were, and you could really see Russia injecting strife into our political system. You know, supporting both sides of an issue, for example, gun rights. Um, what are some other examples you guys can think of? There was gun rights, there was uh, Black Lives Matter, there was immigration issues, there was uh, pro and anti-vaccine. Um, what, what, what I find most amazing about this um, is how sophisticated it is, right? Like how it really does feel natural. Like it doesn't feel like, oh, this is, you know, clearly, you know, you think Russian propaganda, you think World War II constructivist strongmen. But, I mean, this is like, you know, this looks like it's, you know, a 12-year-old made it in, in a good way, right? You're like, oh, this is clearly from a high school kid or clearly from a, an academic or clearly from whatever it is that it's, it's masquerading as. Uh, I would partially agree with the sophistication of it and partially not. Um, you know, when you see the number of impressions they got, um, there's, like, it, it, it's effective but it's effective to people that are already predisposed potentially um, to relate to that content in a specific way and so part of the segmenting of targeting two different audiences on a conflicting issue is so that uh, as we talk more about the AI component of personalized propaganda creating content that people relate to uh, but it's not like you see an image and you're all going to be you know um, marching to Washington in a minute uh, it's it's harder than that. Right. It's not necessarily compelling. It's just convincing. Yeah, and that was another aspect of this essentially influence campaign, as they're calling it, to where it's targeted to people who are predisposed to adopt those beliefs. And that's why you'll see in the news sometimes they'll, talk, they'll refer to the voting rolls being hacked, but no vote tallies were changed. Well, that it's not really the purpose of why they were hacking it. The purpose was to get people's information and demographics, and then so they could target them sort of in another route to change their beliefs that way, rather than just going changing numbers in the computer. That's too easily detectable. So, yes, sir. Um, hi, Laurie. Hold up. Just some reading on it. One of the things that um, I saw emerging in a number of recent articles. Oh, okay. Speech box. Uh, one of the things I saw emerging in a number of uh, uh, recent articles is, is that uh, a lot of the propaganda was aimed at arguing both sides. Yep. So they would take one side of the issue and then some of the same groups putting it out but also argue the other side of the issue. What was really the purpose of doing that? And maybe you just answered it in terms of trying to get demographic segmentation and figuring out how to influence different groups. But was there uh, some other purpose behind doing that? Um. Well, my perception would be that um, there's an interesting alignment uh, between foreign propaganda efforts targeted at destabilizing the United States and legitimate protest movements in the United States that are targeting institutions of power 
uh, and want to um, you know, have legitimate concerns. So uh, an interesting parallel in during the civil rights movement back in the 1950s and 60s, uh, the Communist Party USA was supportive of the civil rights movement. And that might have been both tactically, but also some potentially deep held beliefs. Uh, and so you, you see uh, on the far left and the far right in particular, frustrations uh, with you know, corruption in government, potentially through the influence of money in government. You know, that might be a legitimate concern, but something that can be heightened through Russian propaganda in a way that might um, uh, lead to uh, the, a certain Washington consensus that is opposed uh, by the Russian government um, uh, being, you know, uh, attacked or uh, uh, responding to that. So I, I might think of like, you know, Pat Buchanan uh, is historically a, you know, uh, more isolationistic. He is a realist. He doesn't want the United States, you know, rushing into war abroad. Uh, Russia might be invested in the United States having a more isolationistic foreign policy. That doesn't mean that that's bad or wrong. Uh, it's just that uh, those interests align on that issue. And here's, there was an interview, interesting article in the Washington Post there, where they interviewed a worker who used to work for the Internet Research Agency. Does anyone here know what that was? Or that is, actually? Well, essentially it is a group of people who are working for the R Russian government and they're just spewing out mass quantities of propaganda and they're whether it be comments to videos comments to political campaigns I mean and this is one thing and I'll read to you what he said and to answer I think that answers your question partially it says one of three trolls would write something negative about the news the other two would respond you are wrong and post links and such and the negative one would eventually act convinced these are the kinds of plays we had to act out. So they're creating this fake, entirely fake conversation. So that's where the sort of the psychology of it comes in. And there's a group thinking component to it. And so, you know, people are online and they see these comments and they, they glean a consensus or whatever they do, it, you know, influences people's opinions. So it's very sophisticated in that, in that psychological sense too. Can, can yeah. uh, to structure some of the conversation, I think it might be useful to think of Propaganda by, to use Russia as the continual case study, um, a, a portfolio of different techniques. Uh, and so one would be buying advertisements on Facebook. That was, you know, a lot of, I think, the slides you were handing out were purchased ads. Another would be user generated content where people are pretending to be, you know, a 20 year old in Missouri, a 60 year old in Florida, whatever, and then posting content. So, you know, buying ads is one thing. Pretending to be somebody as sort of a, a bot is another, uh, although that can have a more technical meaning. Um, then a third would be actually having your own websites and posting news. So that can be sort of a portfolio of there being new sites that are potentially uh, more likely to be fact-checked. Um, uh, so, so in my research on RT, I sort of consider that to be uh, a higher quality news product, but they produce other news sites, um, uh, Sputnik, um, Duran, that are a lower quality news site. And so your level of capacity within each news site to like stray from the truth might vary, um, you know, in, or, in order that you're covering lots of different bases. So anyway, just three, three things there would be posting uh, as faux people, uh, buying ads, and publishing news are kind of three different methods of sort of all pushing out uh, a parallel message. Mm -hmm. Does anyone want to talk about bots? That's a great topic. <laughs> sure. I mean, so, I mean, I, I think I think um, we all have kind of the idea of bots as being these kind of automated things that 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 live on Twitter. That uh, probably there's a program somewhere churning things out, and to some extent that's true for some of them. Um, but what's happening right now is a lot more sophisticated in that, um, you know, and, and preface this with a big, this is what we understand, because um, we don't have a man on the inside, but this is kind of what we've been able to understand from, uh, from research that's been done. Um, there are a lot of Twitter accounts that are kind of automated, simple, pushing out messages, retweeting things. Um, 
there's another level of them where people have uh, people who've died or left Twitter or lost their email accounts that have a legitimate Twitter history, their accounts get hacked, get taken over, and those uh, become part of kind of the, the propaganda machine. And these are more convincing because, you know, well, this person has been on Twitter for eight years talking about other things, so now they're talking about this one issue, so probably they're a legitimate human. Um, and then there are kind of larger um, uh, fake institutional accounts uh, that are clearly run by a person uh, all the time or individual people um, because they have a larger audience. I think the, the Tennessee uh, Republican Party Twitter was one of the bigger ones um, that was not from Tennessee or Republican. Um, and, and there's also kind of hybrid accounts which are happening where you'll have accounts that appear to be mostly automated but humans will jump in every now and then um, for big conversations or for, for, for posts that are going to be amplified by the rest of the network. Um, so they definitely look real in those moments. Um, and that way you can have a large amount of accounts uh, that are mostly automated and a small number of people controlling them, kind of hopping from account to account to account to show that they're actually people. And it, it kind of raises one, I guess one of the problems it raises uh, is that legitimate news store or sources will oftentimes pick up that information and start you know incorporating it into their news cycle and so it's really tough to like discern whether these are legitimate sources or whether it's just straight propaganda i mean a lot of this stuff uh i wish i could remember up their examples i handed out but you know it's just people's names like jane smith or something but it was really funded by the russian government so there's it's you know sometimes yet it's really hard to determine you know black i can't remember some of the names black live black lives activists you know from North Carolina or something um, and they're going so far as to like organize rallies buy supplies for rallies buy megaphones here's some money we're going to send you that kind of thing so um, and then the t participants just go out and do the rally and the you know it's, it's coming from St. Petersburg Russia you know where the internet research agency is located so it's really fascinating well, I mean, if you had a reporter, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm asking why exactly it doesn't matter. If, if a reporter was dumb enough to take an internet blog argument as a source of news and post that, or repost that in a uh, news story, they're just depending on a source that they shouldn't depend on because nobody can prove any of the things that they say in these blogs. It's just claims. So if they're willing to take a claim and misrepresent it as a, as a proven fact, then it hardly matters where it originates from a real person or bot. And since all bots are ultimately programmed by people anyway, it's all. It's all ultimately coming from people. It's not like there's an AI right. out there just thinking of things on its own. So yeah, I think that I think what you're getting at is like, if the idea is the same, who cares where it comes from? Right. And I I thought about that as well. I mean, and I think it comes back to wanting to have a genuine discussion in our democracy for America, not have like an outside power injecting its beliefs or skewing the argument. So like for example, police brutality is an issue. I'm not going to say it's not an issue. But if you have 10,000 Russian trolls blowing it up and people are getting you know, agitated by it and are fighting in the streets and people are dying, then that's not the same as having a legitimate bona fide discussion about it with our citizenry. That's, that's the difference I would see. Correct. Right. right. Well, other so countries, that's a free speech issue, yeah. So I'm just going to share that I, I think it's also important to put uh, the level of propaganda the U.S. is currently receiving in perspective. And so if you look at, uh, there is a European Union-based organization that tracks propaganda in Europe. And Eastern European countries uh, are flagged as having far more uh, sort of propaganda-produced memes. I think the word memes is kind of appropriate here. So uh, if people are familiar with the medics, it's the idea that information can spread like, uh, like genes. Uh, and so you know, successful ideas continue to get spread um, and that they propagate that way. And so if facts about uh, military exercises in Russia, facts about whether or not in Ukraine the dissidents are fascists or pro-democracy are like challenges that uh, can get propagated. So at least according to the European Union's account, uh, I don't know if you saw, there was a Netflix story about um, 
uh, these like white helmets in Syria, um, you know, people providing medical relief on the ground. And uh, the Russian meme uh, or story was to basically say that uh, Al Qaeda had somehow infiltrated uh, these uh, medical uh, relief teams. And uh, that was spread through uh, legitimate uh, media publications. Now, you know, it's hard because I'm not a Syrian expert. You know, I, I presume it's not true. Uh, you know, you, you read the things that you can, but it's hard to say, like, what's happening in a small neighborhood in Syria, uh, particularly when, uh, you know, there's misinformation being spread intentionally. Uh, and so uh, I think the challenge is not necessarily that, you know, the Republican, uh, for, for us, we might be experiencing the fake Republican Party of Tennessee, but it's, I think, a little harder to, if, for Eastern Europeans or understanding international news where Russia might be creating facts as well as fiction. Yeah, and I think, I think this is, you know, part of the problem of, of where we're going to end up. Uh, or could end up with with the issue of um, AI being applied to it. That what we see right now as okay, well, you know, these conversations may or may not be uh, may or may not be legitimate. It's going to become a lot harder very soon to determine what legitimate looks like. Maybe would this be a fun place to also talk about Cambridge Analytica Absolutely. as sort of bordering uh, that legitimacy question? Absolutely. Me? No. I, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, we have some questions. Yeah. I just want to say that uh, it also, if you see these posts or whatnot, then you go and Google them. There's legitimate, legitimate looking websites that are then supporting that. You're like, oh, okay. But then you dig deeper into that, and so it becomes almost a full time job to find out what's real and what's not. And just people don't have time for that, you know. Yeah. And people aren't equipped for it, right? Like we don't, we don't. There isn't, you know. A high school class about how to determine, you know, foreign propaganda in your news, right? So right. we we just don't have the skills to do that on a regular basis or the time, right? Like every Facebook post that you see, you see, you don't have the time to fact check everything. No one does. Hey, I was wondering if you maybe you already did. Um, would you make the distinction between AI and just machine learning? Because I think that causes a lot of confusion. AI is really scary. Machine learning is scary, but in a very different and dumb way, I think. Uh, so yeah, I think the important distinction there is machine learning um, you know, can involve neural nets, it involves feeding in information, and then predicting you know, what should come out by creating a sort of a testing loop. Uh, I, I'm not the technologist, so I'll let the technologist describe that better. But I, I was just going to say that like the for machine learning to be effective, it's going to need your information before it can predict something about you. And so if once we get more to the technological side here, um, the uh, maybe uh, this also gets us into the Cambridge Analytica, but like how you're categorized as a person um, will determine, and the amount of data that's been collected uh, will determine the efficacy of the machine learning. Right. So machine learning is not necessarily effective. If, yep. <laughs> uh, okay, so just to jump to Cambridge Analytica for a sec, like they claim that they can categorize people uh, based on some psychological profile. So the psychological profile is um, uh, something called the big five in psychology or ocean. Uh, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, uh, neuroticism, and um, uh, I'm forgetting what the A stands for. Anyway. Uh, but like those five factors, you know, might describe your personality in some broad sense. Um, but but it's also I think that makes it less scary to me to know like, you know, they're talking about five factors, uh, and uh, it, you know, it's the it's the best that psychology has today for personality development. But if I tell you I'm in you know ENTP, uh, I don't know if that necessarily gives you enough information to. Um, convince me of something um, based on that alone. Uh, been doing it for a long time. Yeah. Well, yes. I think one of the things that came out from that Cambridge Analytica was they had developed like a uh, <clears throat> way to psychologically profile you based on your likes, and so uh, they even narrowed it, they pinned it at like 
with 70 likes, knowing what things you liked and getting that information about you, like your Facebook profile or something, we could determine like your skin color to a certain 97 percentile, your political beliefs, your sexual orientation, and all these facts based off your likes. And then with like 150, we knew you better than your, <coughs> excuse me, better than your friends. And with like 300, we knew better than your parents. And then there's like another one above that where we, they could predict your behavior more than you could. Like they knew more about you than yourself in a sense. But that's where the and likes, the information you feed mm -hmm. in right. adds to the efficacy of Absolutely. Uh, the yeah. machine learning. None of that's true. I, I, I concur with that. Well, you're just basing off what we say, which you know. Uh, <laughs> are you, you going to say, and, and it actually works, or this is just what they're I mean, whether, whether Cambridge Analytica themselves were or were not able to, to, to predict with that amount of accuracy, uh, other people can. Amazon definitely can. Facebook definitely can. Netflix definitely can. Um, and I mean, I mean, we is might. Is that true at that level of accuracy? Uh, yes, is the is the short answer. Yeah, I mean, I can't I can't speak to those specific levels of accuracy, but I mean. So, so no. So what level of accuracy? Well, I mean, I can't speak to those specific numbers, but I th but I mean, if you you know, I think everyone has had the 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 moment where they're like, oh, I you know, I've had this conversation about this thing, and now Facebook is showing me an ad um, because they're you know are they checking out my microphone? They're not listening to your microphone. The reality is that they are so good at knowing what it is you're going to need and when you're going to need it that from your already existing behavior, their psychometric profile of you can say, you know, uh, probably this, here's, here's the 20 ads that, that are going to match something that's coming up now because we know what you want. We know what your friends want. We know what your friends are buying. We, we know what, like, um, ad retargeting pixels we're getting from Facebook ads. We know which of your friends' posts you're clicking like on. So it, it's, it's a really sophisticated system, and it's honestly much more scary than if Facebook just had someone listening to your microphone, because at least that's easy. But the reality is you can build very, very accurate predictive profiles at scale of populations. I, I think the important thing there is, though, at the population level and uh, the fact that these are correlations, right. not uh, perfect predictions. So just because you know uh, I like uh, Game of Thrones and Amazon might figure that out, they can throw me a bunch of Game of Thrones uh, action figures, uh, and I might think that's great. But the chance that I buy any one, you know, is probably pretty low. Yeah. Well, there's the old story with basically the Amazon profile, where after taking a look at the Viewing habits and purchasing the teenage daughter to basically figure out she was pregnant. Yeah, that was that was Target, and they uh, and Target yeah, changed Target. their advertising because of that because they got busted. But they could uh, one of their people said they could predict within I think it was like four weeks your due date based on your purchase, <laughs> and that was ten years ago. Yeah. Right? They've they've been doing this for a while. Big data is not a new thing. Yeah, no. Uh, but I think it's also important that uh, Target and Amazon are probably way better at this than Cambridge Analytica. <laughs> but, but that, that, in Is that, for skill, now. Set, that now. skill set has been developing yes. for a long time. Yeah. Right? That's and, the future and, tense. You know, yeah. And, and this is kind of replying. part of the big problem, right, is that, that technology is becoming easier and cheaper and faster and more accessible. Um, I'd like to, you to address, um, you know, you, you've addressed kind of the receiving of propaganda in the U.S., but what about us sending it out to other countries? And um, to follow up on your comment about hacking the voter rolls, mm -hmm. I mean, I actually worked for uh, the Obama campaign, and uh, we actually got hacked by China and Russia. Um, um, and uh, th it happened again this year with uh, Vote Builder, which is the voter file of the DMC. Was, was attacked again. Um, but you can get all of the voter rolls from every state, you know, for about $500. So is it really necessary to potentially expose their intelligence operation instead of setting up a front company 
ordering the voter files from each state and then sending that on to St. Petersburg from there. Hmm. So I'll, I'll maybe uh, speak yeah, they to had social security. They had other stuff besides, yeah. Uh, I was just going to speak to U.S. propaganda efforts abroad, um, which is that the United States, after having a bunch of organizations focused on uh, propaganda during World War I, World War II, uh, ended up creating something called the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which is an independent body, but whose heads are appointed by the president uh, for uh, terms that extend uh, beyond the terms of uh, single presidency. And so that agency receives um, money from Congress to basically put forward a pro-American message through uh, radio uh, and websites uh, to authoritarian states. Uh, and so Cuba, China are getting broadcasted American news. Uh, it's, uh, you know, it's partially independent from the United States. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, not being designed in a way to deceive the public, but you also don't really get a lot of negative American news. You might get, you know, some critical American news, but um, talking about something going on of importance, but it's not, you know, it's, it's pretty pro-American. It's more pro-American than CNN. I think you're, um, you're referring to Voice of America. Yes, Voice of America is one of their media publications. So that's, um, sort of like, that's sort of like our team. Like yes, America. yes. Um, but, I mean, you're uh, really addressing, say, what Yes, uh, and so because it's covert. It's absolutely Um, yeah, so I, I, th I think at the covert level, it's uh, hard to describe like what is specifically going on. I know, like if you jump back to uh, the Marshall Plan, the U.S. government funded um, uh, you know suitcases of cash to non-communist parties in uh, Italy. Uh, you know, so the U.S. has its fair share of trying to uh, manipulate elections abroad uh, in our history. Uh, but I think it's very hard to know what's going on now at that level. Um, uh, but the Broadcasting Board of Governors is what we know, and that's, um, um, I think, the other propaganda dimension, when you think about these fake accounts online that I think is kind of interesting, is the U.S. Uh, tries to catch potential um, uh, terrorists by impersonating uh, terrorist organizations and recruiting, and then before the person participates in a crime, uh, you know, catching them and putting them in jail. And so that seems like a potentially interesting valid form of, um, you know, these fake accounts. And to the degree that it could be automated and made cheaper might be a good thing. Uh, but then, you know, how do you start to distinguish between what is a good form of government-based impersonation, you know, uh, versus a bad form? of government-based <coughs> impersonation. Uh, and I well, think all of these issues are going to be decided by the platforms. So uh, the, the good uses are the ones I agree with, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 Right. yeah. That seems fair. Yeah, yeah and that, that's something that is, is a, it's fluid. I mean, nobody in their, no human being makes a decision in their life that has not been influenced to some degree by somebody else in, on the planet. So like whether it's your parents, whether it's your teachers, whoever, so to make a, you know, a Blair Chantella decision doesn't exist. I mean, we all have to recognize that basic fact that we were raised by parents. We had instructors who taught us things, and they all have become sort of part of our personality. So it's like, where do you draw the line? How surreptitious of a message becomes propaganda versus it's just a strong argument. And so that's, that, well, that's why for me, kind of the definition comes back to whether the message you're receiving really empowers you to make your own decision, makes you think critically, or whether it takes advantage of your mental weak, the human weakness of human nature, as far as you know, herd mentality and those kinds of things. So, yes, I think it would. A lot of advertising campaigns and stuff. Yeah, but the more you're aware of it, the more you are prepared to quit be, you know, deal with it.
Yeah, uh, I have a quick question. Could you just, uh, let's talk about perhaps maybe the limits of propaganda and, for example, uh, you mentioned correlation. For example, like, how do you know that um, it's more, the government is more ineffective now and, you know, you know, like, it, it might not necessarily be that, you know, the Russians are so much more effective. What if government is just less or just more lazy or they're not doing what they used to do? And, you know, like, how do you really, really know, you know, how useful it is? Because I'm pretty sure that there are other countries that don't have these issues, probably in the Nordic regions, where they're not really seriously saying that because they have strong educational systems. So intriguingly, the Nordic regions are really uh, being equally, you know, targeted by uh, uh, Russian propaganda. Uh, I, th I think things you might look at would be, though, uh, trust in governance, um, and there you might see differences between countries in terms of the efficacy of propaganda in removing sort of social trust. Um, I, I think another sort of question of efficacy, to your point, would be. Um, uh, how much, you know, if you count the number of stories, the number of impressions, there might be metrics-based ways, I just think like an academic, to, to measure uh, what's going on here. Uh, and there's been some work in, in that dimension to try and count impressions, and uh, that's been, I think, particularly successful with the ads uh, purchased on Facebook, uh, but gets, you know, more uh, distributed when you talk about the websites they have. Yeah, and it's also highly cultural, right? Like the type of propaganda that works in one place is, you know, maybe totally ineffective in other places. Cambridge Analytica um, worked as part of the um, the Kenyan election um, in a in a legitimate legitimate capacity to, to to you know work for one of the parties there, but they didn't understand the way the the Kenyan political process worked on a social level. They didn't understand the way that, that Kenyans made decisions about politics and, and it was not effective at all there for them, despite it being a playbook that could have worked really, really well elsewhere. So I think it, it a part of it is um, whether you have the expertise to know how propaganda works on the specific population you're targeting. I think it's also interesting that like, you know, China has their own propaganda organizations and they tend to have a message that's basically like, China's great, nothing to worry about here. Um, <laughs> and so uh, that, that ends up just not resonating as much. If your message is like, you know, China's great, uh, then if it's, uh, you know, how can we get Americans to like start, you know, brawling in the streets, uh, that, that's a more engaging message. And so your click-through rate on a tweet that like is something, you know, uh, that, that just makes your blood boil is going to be higher, or your retweet weight rate, uh, than just reading, like, you know, China's great. I was going to say, I, I, don't, I don't know the source, and I apologize, but, uh, you know, I, I did read something recently on social media about, you know, there, a lot of the stuff that you are presented with, um, you're targeted based on, they found that the more upset or enraged that you become, the longer you will stay on the platform, you know? How many times does somebody sit there and write a four paragraph essay to somebody on something that they completely agree with them on? So, um, I, I used to have a, a browser plugin called FB Purity, FB Buster that removed all ads, so I didn't see ads. I mean, I ended up deleting my Facebook. Just because for me, ads don't work. I, I just report them all as offensive or lewd or <laughs> nudity or whatever, just to just to just to fuck with. Excuse me, to mess with the algorithm. But um, but I, I guess at, at some point there has sh there surely has to be studies on on you know the people who ads are not affecting like what else you know what other avenues do you have? So I'm not going to say that I'm impervious and that I don't I probably am making multiple mistakes on. In disclosing personal details, but uh, I guess, do you know? I don't know. I guess more of a, you know, there's targeted. If you're, if people are not exposed, or, or people kind of liken the fact that, you know, at what point do you decide 
okay, well, the social media is great because it connects with my friends and family, but more and more encroaching, I, I just keep thinking about um, Ready Player One, you know, how, how ads and things slowly and creeping in, you know, that Facebook is becoming, you know, skinnier and skinnier with what you're doing and, and lighter and lighter on the, your friends and families things and more on other stuff. So, like, at what point, at what point do we scrap social media or, you know, they're making a lot of money off of it, obviously. Right. Uh, using it. Well, let me, let me actually ask a quick question here. How many people here, raise your hand, if you would say that you were very susceptible to advertising? Like, like <laughs> five, yeah, seven people. How many people here would say that advertising as an industry is effective? Who do you think it's working on? Right? Like, like everyone thinks that, you know, it, it works on my friends. It doesn't work on me. And... I don't know. I give the Dragon Kong demographic a little more credit. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, we are here. We are here in this room talking about it. But, it. but advertising does work in the same way harassment works, in the same way that, that any kind of sustained, um, repeated stimulus has an effect on someone. And I think that... I think that when it comes to social media, what a lot of social media has been kind of built on, those algorithms have been built on, is engagement, right? Like if someone engages with this content, probably it's good content and we'll promote it and we'll show it to more people, right? So that's like clicks and likes and comments and shares and, and um, but what's happening is that the content that is getting that engagement is largely content people are pissed off about, right? Like if you see something and you're like, this is wrong, and you write, this is wrong, you're engaging. Right? You're, if you send it to your friends, can you believe this, this nonsense? And they all you know, pile on and say, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. That's a really high engagement post. And so the, the systems that were kind of built without a lot of thinking as, as to the you know, downstream emergent effects of it have had this impact where they are now bringing to the surface content that is likely to get you to engage. And probably if you're engaging, um, you know, there's a, there's a decent chance that, that it is an emotion-based reaction. So that's kind of where we ended up. Uh, I, I think an interesting trend here, too, has been um, uh, YouTube. Uh, there's been some recent evidence that, um, at least in the past couple of years, YouTube sort of drives you to extremes in your videos. So if you think that you want to start jogging and you read about running for them, you're going to eventually get videos about, like, ultra marathons. You know, if you're interested in uh, giving up uh, beef, you're going to learn about veganism. You know, if you're interested in uh, immigration policy, you know, you might get the alt-right. Uh, and so there's, even if that's not uh, foreign propaganda, I think in terms of how uh, these um, algorithms drive engagement, uh, engaging with the extremes is something that can uh, sort of move in a one-directional capacity um, because it keeps you on the platform. I tend to think one great way to sort of uh, help protect yourself from pop propaganda is intentionality uh, in your choices. So um, if you are following specific people on uh, Twitter, I think that might be better than uh, letting, you know, um, uh, the algorithm decide who you should be following uh, and you know letting you sort of be pushed into a certain direction I think if you care about the institutions of the organizations uh, and try to vet what you think is their uh, editorial process so you know the New York Times is uh, gonna have a better quality uh, process of fact-checking than uh, a smaller blog that doesn't mean you can't follow the smaller blog. It just means that you should uh, be engaged with the fact that, like, um, there's a, a spectrum of uh, the quality of news production uh, that's partly based on resources uh, and the time put into each story. Uh, that's a good point. I think we have a question way in the back. To uh, follow up on the... Oh. Oh. No, go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Oh, to follow up on that, one, you are correct, because I've actually experienced that YouTube phenomenon myself, and I'll be like, where'd this come from? <laughs> <laughs> and it'll be someone that I despise. And I'll be like, that's odd. Anyway, so yes, that I've, I've experienced that myself, but on the, on the topic of the actual 
shenanigans that is the YouTube algorithm that that as I as an observation that I have noticed that whether for what means I don't know but that a lot of pre-video ads now seem seem to be being pulled from the a similar source in writing and in, in, in both in both the way it is shown with with images and video what have you and writing quit on me no oh, there okay. we go in a very similar fashion to the infamous Facebook ads and that's been I've, and that's been observation that I've seen become abundantly clear about the past year year and a half and a lot of times it'll be completely unrelated to what you're watching so sorry I just thought of that when you said that about YouTube <laughs> yeah I think there's a lady in the back So if the algorithms are a numbers game, right? So if we create a lot of bots that are putting out massive amounts of messages that are measured and try to get to people, um, give people the tools to make a good decision, would that help? Well, I mean, it, it, it's it's a numbers game, but it's it's a co it's a really complicated one, right? Like it's not it's not just what video is getting the most engagement it's what are the videos you know not videos or comments or wherever you are yeah. it's you know what are similar things that person likes what do people like them like um, there's a researcher um, actually a, a Mozilla fellow who she was doing research on um, on the anti-vax movement and so she was watching a lot of anti-vax videos on YouTube and uh, and YouTube started uh, strongly recommending to her um, Pizzagate videos and truther videos um, because people who are into these things often end up kind of in other things and, and so it's hard to know how you can game the system in a way that's effective right I mean that's it's their entire industries of people trying to figure out how to game the system to make a lot of money so it's 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 really really tough I, I might su suggest specifically with YouTube, you can uh, delete your history. And so that's one way to uh, sort of reset a little bit back to zero, uh, you know, with the algorithm. And so keeping, you know, being aware of what information about you is collected and how a profile about you is essentially being made uh, to feed you things that uh, you seemingly like or are more likely to click on, uh, you know, be aware of what that profile contains. I think the fact that you're bothered by those commercials is a good sign, sir, to reach your question. Because if you just sat there passively watching whatever and you didn't even like realize what you're watching is like a certain way, then that's kind of like where they want you. You know, the, I, I hate commercials. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I can quote them. You know, I watch CNN sometimes, MSNBC or whatever. And I can pretty much quote all of them, and they're so repetitious. I mean, it's it's. I mean, you watch something 20 times, why the heck aren't you annoyed? You know, <laughs> if you're not, there's something wrong there. You just become accustomed to it, I think. So. Yeah, so hold on to that discomfort. Yeah, hold on to that. Be, you know, realize what you're watching over and over and over and over and over. I wanted to kind of go back to this idea of engagement um, and ask a couple of questions. One is, is there a way, has there been research into um, qualitative measures um, of engagement. Like, not just that a person clicks through or is engaged, but how deeply or how effective um, a particular campaign is. And to follow up on that, um, if so, is there any um, research to suggest that this differs by age? Um, because I am, a woman of a certain age, and I loathe Facebook. I just loathe it. Um, and I, I'm not on Twitter. I'm not on Instagram. I, I am just not interested. I don't want to see pictures of other people's food. I don't want to get hassled by Russian bots. <laughs> 
So I'll, I'll just speak to, uh, I think a lot of that research uh, is a little harder to get because it comes on the sort of Google Analytics side of the website. So, you know, the person maintaining a website or a social media profile gets all sorts of great descriptive statistics about their, you know, click-through rate and like, you know, how many likes they've got and all of that. You can do some of that. So in my work, I've been uh, scraping RT uh, videos and uh, with that came sort of associated metadata, like like data uh, and, you know, the number of views. And so, you know, I can use that as sort of a proxy. And uh, I'm kind of specifically interested in um, the ratio of, you know, uh, Russian media figures appearing on the network versus American media figures. And uh, it's way biased in favor of American video, uh, American people on the specific RT show that I scraped. Um, and so I, it, it just, I think you come away with these interesting lessons um, uh, about how propaganda is um, being spread, uh, but it's hard, I think, to get the demographic information about, you know, I, I don't know who liked the videos. Yeah, and social, social media networks uh, often have widely uh, various uh, age demographics, right? Like, like uh, some social networks are younger than others in that sense, right? Like Instagram is younger than Facebook. You know, Facebook is older than Twitter, you know, depending on, on what is cool to what audience. I think we had a question right over here. Well, uh, there's something that uh, I, a mathematician that I follow on YouTube made a comment about. It, it was uh, V Heart, where uh, if someone makes a video based on a certain topic, and I may be misremembering things, uh, if someone makes a video on a certain topic, and it's targeted towards their enemy, basically, uh, the enemy blows up on some certain thing that it was basically just a trap for them, so that they would get angry at the video, post about the video, and show their hand too much, then anybody who sees the response to it and either doesn't like that person or sees the the flaws in their argument or sees that they're they're harping on this one thing this one little trap in the previous video they're more likely to see the previous video because they're feeling like they're being more conscientious as more truthful in that this person just exploded on it that's oh. a great description of trolling yeah yeah you yeah. you just make your your enemies hate your video, and then anybody who doesn't like them goes, well, maybe that other person's a pretty cool dude. Right. Yeah, and this is something that that, um, that uh, people on places like 8chan have weaponized to extraordinary effect. Um, it It is a, a big problem in that, you know, kind of like, like fake news, we don't really know how to deal with it, like a, kind of at the large scale. People if they see something that is, you know, genuinely infuriating, they get infuriated. Um, and exploiting that is, you know, is, is one of the things that makes propaganda really effective. I do kind of want to point out, too, that I think there are some interesting challenges to, you know, trolling propaganda where, like, one of the great joys of the Internet is a little bit of the Wild West character, uh, you know, that, that it has had historically uh, and it being a free space for communication. Uh, but clearly, you know, there are serious negative consequences. And so platforms might be able to move in the direction of restricting that kind of content, but it might be at the sacrifice, you know, by sacrificing uh, freedom of speech for specific groups or privacy uh, for people more collectively if there's, uh, you know, more viewing of the materials um, so, so anyway, I just think there are values discussions at play here uh, as to how much, uh, what kind of speech you allow to exist on different Yeah, we're, we're starting to see that play out, too, with Facebook taking actions to remove ads and Twitter uh, taking down some, what do you call them, Twitter profiles. And then Donald Trump, our president of the United States, is tweeting that they're persecuting conservatives. And so, you know, there's always that risk that it's going to be perceived as censorship and um, so... Well, that actually relates to my question. Um, so going back to the Russia, China influence type situations, um, is there anything being done right now or any plans for anything to be done to fight that sort of propaganda? 
We've been fighting it. I know our government's been fighting it. I think it's just become apparent the battle has become in the public sphere more recently because it involved in our election. But, but what are we doing? I mean, is there any kind of technological solution? Like, for example, you know, email accounts filter out spam. I mean, is, is there any kind of technological developments that are being done to fight outside so, influence? So, like, Facebook's taken individual steps uh, to um, review their advertisers uh, more thoroughly uh, and has also, as stated previously, taken steps to uh, remove people that are perceived as being foreign intelligence, uh, you know, operations or bots. But that's been at sort of the corporate level, mm -hmm. uh, at the request of the government, um, mm. more or less, but without there being actual regulations in place. So there's an interesting question about what level of internet uh, portal, or you know, how, how large should a company be to need to validate that its users are legitimate users, and what does that validation entail? Do we want you know, uh, the government looking and making sure everybody has a driver's license or passport? That seems highly invasive. Mm -hmm. uh, but you would also uh, want these larger platforms to be monitoring uh, you know, their users at, to some degree. So it's, it's, uh, uh, there's been legislation more on the regulatory side, um, but it's not gotten uh, up to a vote. Yeah. And the, a legal aspect drafted. too is that these companies, they have these terms of service. And so, yes, they can remove people based on their terms of service, or they could even censor people, theoretically, because you know First Amendment issues don't truly, I guess, legally come into play unless it's government action. You know, it's like you invite someone to your house, you can say, I don't like what you're saying, you need to leave. Yeah, you I mean, know? Twitter, yeah. Right. Yeah, Twitter could say tomorrow we, we you know, we're going to ban anyone who talk who says their favorite color is blue, and you know they're totally within their rights to do that. Right. Um, I think part of the problem that we're going to see soon is it's whether we have kind of legislation like this in, in place or not. It's going to become much harder to figure out and enforce. Um, I don't know how many people saw that that video of of Google um, that Google put out of. I forget what it was called, but basically like Google making a phone call. They called a hair salon, and it sounded like a person, and everyone's like, well, that's, that's scary. Um, think about what that will look like when that is kind of like easy and cheap, and you can do that on, at scale on Twitter, right? Like if, you know, if, if I'm working on an activist project and I want to get some support behind it, and I can deploy 20,000 Twitter accounts that I'll have that level of kind of like sophistication in conversation, it's going to be a lot harder to figure out that those are bots and those are, are um, in violation of a terms of service than it is now. And for those who don't know that example, basically, I guess Google had, was it an AI system? That would you characterize it as that? I don't know the like like technical name for it. Yeah, it was like a, a, they, they, like, they've been working on machine learning kind of like for conversation for a really, really long time. So it was an extension so of it that was, work. So it was like a machine speaking in a human voice sounded like a real person with a certain intonations, and they called a hair salon. It was sort of like a Turing test, if you know that term, where it's can you convince a real, yeah, can you convince, can a machine convince a human being that they're really speaking to a human? And the person had no inkling, essentially, and I think it was just a hair salon call. Or yeah. Something. yeah. And, and if that's audio, the even scarier thing will uh, be deep fakes, uh, the capacity to like put uh, someone's face on another figure uh, and have them give a speech or make a statement, um, you know, by digitally cropping their head. Uh, so if you look up the word deep fakes, um, it, if there's a future where you don't know if video is real or not, in a way where people have kind of assumed that video is not being edited, it represents the truth. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> Do we have time for one more, or is that? Yeah. Maybe? That's it. All right. Okay. We'll answer questions. All right. I, before everyone goes, thank you for coming again. I have some books I'd like to give out to whoever wants. I have A Clockwork Orange. Who here has read that one? Okay. It's different than the movie. The ending's different. He actually learns his way. He learns to not be an asshole. Spoilers. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then I have 1984. Who hasn't read it? I'd love to give it to someone to read, but they have to promise to actually try and read it. Don't spoil it. So, and then Manufacturing Consent by Noam Chomsky. Um, this is the gem. This Classic. is a good yeah. one. Can we get uh, uh, yes. Yeah, just come on, get it. Come up. Come up. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Have a good.